Many people were scared off from worship service this morning because our prognosticators said how terrible it would be. And we woke up in the 40s and uh, they got that one a little bit off. But I think maybe by the end of the day, it'll be different. Everybody's been forecasting what's going to happen in 2014. One tremendously brilliant poll on January 2nd from the Associated Press said that in 2014, Americans would have little faith in their government to make any progress with the problems at hand. Now, that was a real difficult one, wasn't it? Uh, January 3rd, The Nation magazine says, uh, Welcome to the new America, the low wages nation. Jobs with low wages. That was their prognostication. Uh, For this coming year, someone on the morning show this morning said that in 2014, it'll be whites and pastels that will be in this year. So everybody go out and buy whites and pastels if you want to be up with what's going to happen uh, this year. Uh, You know, uh, some people said, as far as uh, what I read, that this year we're going to produce all kinds more natural gas and energy in the United States than we did. Who knows what's going to happen this year? How much do you trust the prognosticators? You know, in Isaiah 47, the people trusted in astrologers and soothsayers. And sometimes they would gut an animal and take the liver and the kidneys and they would look at the entrails and they would try to foretell the future. And God said, woe to you that trust in such things. We don't know what's going to happen this year, do we? We don't know what's going to happen. But whatever happens, wherever we go, we want to go there with God. Where will you go this year? Where will we go today, Will we this year? Will we cross deserts of sorrow this year? Will we ascend to heights of joy this year? Will we have the greatest uh, time we've ever had? Will we form new relationships this year? Will we do new things and explore new possibilities this year? I hope so. But wherever we go, we need to go there with God. You know, God is the God that parts the waters. God is the God that turns the simple staff into something that can part the Red Sea. God exalts the humble. God brings down the mighty. So wherever we go, and hopefully it's going to be going and trying to do the will of God, we need to go with God. You know, there's, a, there's the song that says, I want Jesus to walk with me. But I guarantee you, if you walk with Jesus, he will walk with you, see? And whatever we do, we need to do it with God. We can do anything through him who strengthens us, right? Philippians chapter 4 Verse 13. So as we go into this coming year, I want to challenge you like we sang a moment ago. It may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sunshine where I in peace abide. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Amen? Are we going to have a good year? Yes, we are going to have a good year, no matter what happens if we go where we go with Jesus. Number one on your outline today, go this year in 2014 in faith like Moses did. You know, when Moses knelt before that burning bush and took off his shoes, he expressed his fears to God and God greeted him, I am that I am, and he says, he says to Moses, I want you to go down to Egypt. I remember my people. I want you to deliver my people and bring them out. And Mo- Moses says, but, 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 but God, what if, we could all get t- tied down in what ifs, couldn't we? Oh, what if this happens, or what if that happens? And the fear paralyzes us. Moses says, well, what if I go? And they say to me, Uh, This God that sent you, what is his name? And I don't know what to tell him. And God said, you tell him, I am that I am, has sent me unto you. Okay, well, that didn't solve Moses' problem. So he says, "But, but what if, God, what if these people want some kind of a sign from me to show them that you're with me? God gave him two or three that would work and said, okay, now what, Moses? He said, but, but what if, God? What if I get up there and my tongue's tied and I can't speak and and I just mess the whole thing up? And God said, who made your mouth? I'll be with your mouth and I'll even give you a spokesman and so forth. So finally, God took away all of his excuses. And God said, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and I want you to stand before Pharaoh who has the power of life and death death in his hands. And I want you to uh, effect the deliverance of my people. A verse that I just saw this week. I do this all the time studying. 
and I see something that I've never seen before. But this verse struck me. It's Exodus 4, verse 20. When God finally told him to to go and he decided to trust God and go, it says, So Moses took his wife and his sons and put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. I had never noticed before that Moses didn't just go. He took his wife and his children And headed back there into the lion's teeth to do what God told him to do. Now that takes faith. And it took courage as he went before uh, the throne of Pharaoh. A, on your outline, Moses trusted God to break the will of Pharaoh. You know, I can't imagine, even though Moses was familiar with the Egyptian court and the Pharaohs and all that, him having the gall and, and the faith to go in before Pharaoh and ask what he did. In Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, here's what the Bible says. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. And Pharaoh said, and see, sometimes we say, well, well, what if I get rejected? You know, what if I step out there in faith and somebody doesn't like it or I hurt their feelings or they reject me? Listen to what Pharaoh blew back into Moses' face. He said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. And yet time after time, Moses went back, and God brought the plagues, and Moses went back into the court of an angry Pharaoh. And time after time, Moses stated the demands of God, and he trusted God. Next, he trusted God to take them through the Red Sea. Now, when, when the, the army of Egypt was chasing them on one side and the Red Sea was on the other side and they were hemmed in there and Moses and the children of Israel were crying out to God in fear, like maybe some of us cry out to God in fear as we start this new year. In Exodus fourteen fifteen, God said this, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move forward. Wait a minute, God. The only thing forward is the sea. Tell the Israelites to move forward, God said. Raise your staff to stretch out your hand and see the sea uh, to divide the waters. And so Moses raised his staff and it says all night long that night, the east wind blew and the angel of the Lord stood between the army of, of Egypt and the Israelites. And it was dark on the side of Egypt and light on the side of the Israelites. And in the morning they walked through on dry ground. Because Moses trusted God. Can you imagine? The wheels came off the chariots of the Egyptians when they pursued them. The waters came back over them. And Miriam and the children of of Israel's women danced the next day on the shores of the sea. And they said, Sing ye to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has drowned in the depths of the sea. You know, how many times do we fear what's coming? We dread what's coming. We, we, we shrink back from what might be or what may be and the what ifs. And yet, if we just trust God, no matter what comes, God will bless us and God will see us through. Number two today, go in obedience like Joshua did. You know, when Moses died, think about Moses and how much confidence the people had in Moses. And when Moses died and he was no longer there with them, and now it was all up to Joshua to take the children of Israel into the land of, of Canaan. Think about what was in the mind of Joshua. God comes to Joshua in Joshua 1, verse 6. Listen to what God said to him. Joshua, you be strong and courageous. Are you strong and courageous as you go into this year? I will admit to you that I have a little bit of trepidation in me about what might happen. See? Now, sometimes the young people haven't been through enough to have any fear. And so they don't have any fear at all. They can take the world. The older people have been hit on and, and, and struck several times, and they've been through some things, and they've got sense enough to know that some bad stuff might come our way, and so we have great trepidation sometimes. But he says, be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their fathers to give them. You be strong and courageous, Joshua. And he said, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Are you on the right or are you on the left? Well, we shouldn't be either. We should stick right with what the book says. 
Do this so that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. You know, after they came through the wilderness on the other side in Deuteronomy 8, Moses said, you've learned that man does not live by bread only, but by what? But by every word that comes out of the mouth of God shall man live. So this year, when you're stuck in the mire and you don't know what to do, let me tell you what to do. This is very, very simple. In the moment, at the time, wherever you find yourself, obey God. Obey God in that moment. Do what God wants you to do at that moment. And you know what will happen if you just obey God at the moment? God will carry you through. Like with Joshua. First sub-point there. Through obedience, he crossed the Jordan. Here they come up to the Jordan River. Forty years after, they had come up to the land of Canaan the first time. And the people said, oh no, we can't do this. The people are giants and the cities are fortified. And they had to wander 40 more years. Now they come up to the Jordan River. They're ready to cross through. And God says to Joshua, you tell the priests to go down into the river and stand there. Well, the river was at flood stage. It was a horrible looking thing and it was swelling and the current was going. And God said, no, you tell the priest to take the Ark of the Covenant, go down into the river and stand in the middle of the river. Okay, says Joshua. And he told the priest, I'd hate to be in one of those priests, wouldn't you? At that time, you say, what? Say, you want me to do what? And so they marched in there and their feet touched the river and they stand, stood in the river and the river's waters began to part and, and the river's waters went on down and the waters upstream stood up and the people of Israel marched through on dry ground. Why? Because in the moment, in that moment, they obeyed God. And then God said, I want you to go to the city of Jericho and I want you to march around it every day for seven days. Seventh day, march around it seven times, you know, and shout and Break the pictures and all that kind of stuff. Through obedience, the cities fell. It wasn't because they were military geniuses. It was because they did what the Lord told them to do. Hannah's prophetic statement was true back then. She said, it is not by strength that one prevails, but those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. Now, some of you feel ten feet tall and bulletproof. I can tell you that I don't. I realize more than ever how weak and how vulnerable I truly am. It is not by strength that man prevails. But I do know this. At every moment, at every day, no matter what comes this year, at every moment, if we will just do what God said to do, the walls will come down. The waters will part. And God will bless the things that we do. Joshua knew that disobedience would be the downfall of the people. You know, the walls of Jericho come down. They're on a high. And they're moving up through the land of Canaan. And they say there's this little bitty town of Ai there. And this should be easy if Jericho was such a pushover. And so, oh, we just need 3,000 men to go up there. We don't need the whole army of Israel. So they send the 3,000 men up to Ai. And they get whooped badly. Oh, no, everything was going good. Why, what's wrong? And God said, somebody's in the camp is disobeying me. And they've taken the devoted things. And it was Achan who stole the treasures and buried them in his tent, even though God said, don't do it. And they rooted him out. And they stoned him to death. And they burned his body. And then God gave them the rest of the cities because they were doing what God told them to do. Church, the Lord won't tolerate sin in his camp. He won't tolerate a high hand and a rebellious attitude from his people doing whatever we want to do. If we do God's will, he will bless us. Joshua knew that was the answer to everything. Number three, this year in 2014, go in prayer like Nehemiah did. A great musical philosopher turned me on to the words of John Fulbright. And those words go something like this. Listen. I only pray at night. When the world disappears, when it's put away and out of sight, then I confront my fears 
I am proud. I am strong. I'm endowed. Just as long as it's light. You see, I only pray at night. Are you that way? You put on your front, you put on your airs, you go out to the world, you have confidence, you can do anything. You're proud, you're strong, you're endowed, and then at night, you show God your fears, or do you even pray at night? Folks, what a tragedy it would be if we as a people of God only prayed at night, or if we only prayed in the morning, or if we only prayed when no one else was around, Or we only prayed in a crisis. Nehemiah was a servant. He was a cup bearer. He was not some great and mighty man. And yet Nehemiah prayed when he heard of the the situation that was befalling Jerusalem. And the walls were falling down. He prayed that God would somehow bless him. And then he went into the king and the king said, uh, Nehemiah. He said, why are you so down today? What's the problem and what can I do for you? And Nehemiah explained and he said, well, what do you want? And Nehemiah knew that Artaxerxes the Persian could kill him with a wave of his hand and he could he could uh, divest him of a position. He could do whatever. But in that moment when the king said, what is it you want? He prayed to the God of heaven, it says in Nehemiah. And God answered his prayer and the king gave him more than he ever thought possible. Do you pray through the moments of your day when you're about to talk to somebody and you want it to go well? Do you pray right then and there? When you're about to have an interaction with somebody that you want to influence for good, do you pray? When you're about to talk to a son or daughter that's having trouble, do you pray? Do you pray while you're driving in your car? Do you pray through the day? John Fulbright said, I only pray at night. May God help us, folks. If we only pray, thank God is great, God is good, and we thank Him for the food at the dinner table. If that's all we do, may God help us. God will be with those who pray. Nehemiah surveyed the walls, fallen down around Jerusalem in prayer. He told them that the good hand of God was upon them, that God would give them success. And when he faced the task and the obstacles that came against them, Tobias and Sanballat and the enemies... The Bible says in in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9, but we prayed to God and we posted a guard. See, we just prayed and we posted a guard and we kept on working. Nehemiah 6, verse 9. The people were afraid and Nehemiah said they were all trying to frighten us, saying that their hands will get too weak to do the work. But I prayed, O Lord, strengthen thou my hands. Was there any time in 2013... When you were at the bottom of the, of the heap and you were at the bottom of the depths of despair and, and you prayed to God, Lord, uh, I need the strength to get through this, strengthen thou my hands. Of course there is and there might be again this time. But keep on praying and God will keep on blessing. This church cannot be defeated individually or collectively if we will pray all the time. Number four. Go in God's power like the apostles. Now, the apostles were scared to death at the Last Supper. Do you realize that? In the book of John, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, that's about Jesus and the apostles at the Last Supper. And as he talked to them in John 14, 1, he said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Because he could look at their faces and see that they were upset, they were afraid, they were worried. Anybody worried here this morning about what's going to happen next week or next month or during this year? About whatever these guys were worried. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. And he told them that they had a big job to do. Wow. Sometimes you say, I can barely take care of myself, much less do some great big job. Think of the job Jesus was giving his apostles. In John 15, 16, he said to them at that last supper, even though they were afraid, you didn't choose me, he said. I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear much fruit and that your fruit might remain. And they're sitting here, we don't know what to do. And what are you talking about leaving us? And and we're afraid, see. Jesus told them that they were going to go forth in God's power. And so they saw God's power in the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. 
You know, Paul prayed for us in the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 1.19, that you may know what is the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe, according to the working of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. God's power works in people that believe. In Luke 24, 49, he told the apostles, stay in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. They waited for God's power to begin their mission. In Acts 1, 8, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. They were waiting for the power of God. And some of you say, well, that was then. And this is now. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for one second. Paul prayed that we might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. He said, God, I can't. Yes, but God can. And through the little things that you do, the little acts of love to your children and your grandchildren, the little, the little acts of kindness to a person in the community, the little words that you say, the power of God works through those things, and great things are done. The apostles were empowered by God to proclaim the gospel uh, to the world. These same guys that were fearful on the day of Pentecost had flames of fire over their heads, and they boldly proclaimed the gospel. And then they they were beaten, they were arrested, they were threatened. And you know what they did when they were beaten and arrested and threatened? They prayed. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it said they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. What's going to happen in 2014? Oh, they're going to drill for a lot of natural gas. Okay. People are going to wear pastels and whites. I could care less, obviously. Uh, People are going to, uh, uh, you know, not trust their government. Okay, what else is new? Some of us are going to die. Some of us are going to have great successes. Some of us are going to have our greatest joy. Some of us will go through our greatest sorrows. But let me tell you what. If we go in faith like Moses did, if we go in obedience and just obey God every step of the way like Joshua did, if we go forth in prayer every step of the way like Nehemiah did, church... And if we go forth in the power of God like the apostles did, you know what? This is going to be a good year. This is going to be a good year. And let me tell you something else. No matter what happens to me or you, if we go with God, it'll be a good year. We know that to them that love God and are called according to his purpose, he works all things together for good. You want to have a good year? Then go with God. And if you don't have God yet, if you, don't, if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ yet, you need to. Can we help you this morning? We're so glad you're here. If we can help you obey the Lord, please come as we stand together.